All right, well, welcome to the weekly MCUBE uh, seminar. Today our uh, speaker is uh, Robert Nystrom. Uh, Robert got his uh, BS degree in atmospheric science from the University of Illinois uh, in Urbana-Champaign. In uh, 2020, he completed a PhD in meteorology uh, from uh, Penn State University under uh, the tutelage of uh, Fuching Zhang and Stephen Graybush. He arrived here at NCAR at uh, September 2020 as an ASP postdoc. And as you can see, he's been uh, making the rounds, working with all the, all the right people, happen to be in this room, at least two of them. And um, so his talk today is uh, Tropical Cyclone Predictability and Opportunity at the Air-Sea Interface. Robert? Thanks, Rich. Uh, is the microphone OK? Huh? Good. All right, um, so yeah, I'm excited to share uh, kind of what I've been working on the past about year and a half since uh, arriving here at, at NCAR, and as we'll see, some of this work builds on uh, some early work uh, from during uh, my PhD. And so um, this talk uh, could easily be titled Challenges at the ARC Interface instead of Opportunity, as you'll see. Often where there's a lot of challenge, there's also uh, a lot of opportunity. And so why, why tropical cyclones? So I probably don't need to to motivate this much to the folks in this room. But this is just a, a map I like to show at, at really any opportunity. And this is a look at the, the billion dollar uh, weather and climate disasters from the past year. And you'll notice a number of, of hurricanes here along the Gulf Coast. And if we were to actually look at kind of a, a bigger summary of this over the past 10 years, the most costly uh, of these disasters, uh, actually over 50% of the total cost of these uh, disasters comes from tropical cyclones. So they're a huge impact on, on society. And of course, we're interested in, in the predictions of these, hence the name, uh, the title of this talking about the predictability. And so a, as we often well know, the predictability of, of the atmosphere is um, intrinsically, limited, uh, intrinsically limited, excuse me, um, by you know, small errors in the initial conditions growing rapidly, um, often through, through moist convection. Um, but our predictability is also limited by uh, errors in the, the current state of the atmosphere, current uh, models, and you can think of that as actually our, our practical predictability here on the left. And so this is the schematic taken from a, a paper almost a decade ago now. Um, and this uh, figure on the left here is showing a uh, schematic of practical predictability. So we have some initial um, ensemble here. We have an equal number approximately of members in some, some good and poor regime, whatever, whatever that means to you. And um, this is an example where if by some means we're able to improve our initial, say, estimate of the current state of the atmosphere, we're able to improve our models, we're actually able to uh, become more confident in the correct, uh, correct forecast. We're able to move these ensembles closer to the truth in this case. On the other hand, if we're um, more limited by our intrinsic predictability, our kind of intrinsic limit that you know, Ed Lorenz uh, made famous uh, decades ago, it actually doesn't matter how much we continue to reduce our initial conditions um, or how much we uh, continue to improve our models, um, we still have basically an equal number of, of forecasts in both this, this good and uh, poor regime. So if we want to make a difference in terms of improving forecasts, we obviously hope that there's this, a difference between our current practical predictability and this intrinsic limit. OK, um, and we're going to be talking about hurricanes uh, specifically today and the prediction of those. So before we get into um, kind of some of the uh, predictability challenges there, I think it's important to give a, a baseline understanding of how uh, tropical cyclones actually intensify. And so what I'm showing here is just a cross section uh, through, through a hurricane. Um, this is the eye of the hurricane here in the center, so your eye wall where your strongest wind speeds are kind of right, radially outward of that. And so what you see near the surface um, has this trajectory towards the center. It's actually spiraling uh, inwards uh, towards the center. And as it's doing so, it's, it's trying to uh, transport this high angular momentum air uh, towards the center and act to, to spin up the storm. Um, but at the same time, there's um, interactions going on with the air-sea interface. Now, one of those being um, that's kind of a positive uh, contribution to the, the storm in terms of its intensity is these fluxes of, of moist enthalpy, so fluxes of latent and sensible heat that are coming from the underlying ocean. And um, you know, that's really the fuel that, that drives these hurricanes. Uh, on the other end of that, there's a kind of competing effect, and that's the, the friction uh, related to um, basically the surface friction, the interaction of this with the, the ocean surface. 
And so these are kind of competing forces. And if you're um, under the scenario of which you know, you're adding a lot of heat and enthalpy, um, a lot of heat and moisture to the, to the hurricane, um, it can actually intensify. And so you'll get you know, stronger thunderstorms, for instance, in the eye wall. Um, that, those strong thunderstorms will release a lot of diabetic heating. And uh, you'll, you know, this outflow aloft, you'll eventually get this divergence when this, this rising air hits the, the tropopause, and you end up with this, this secondary uh, circulation that you may be familiar with. And so there's a positive feedback of this where uh, the surface pressure is actually going to um, you know, deepen if, if you're adding a lot of heat to the system. And that has a positive feedback then on your wind field. You're increasing your, your pressure gradient within the inner core. And so then you're actually ending up with a positive feedback on your uh, surface um, enthalpy fluxes, and then a negative feedback basically on this frictional dissipation. So it's really these surface fluxes play a critical role in the energetics of, of tropical cyclones. And of course, that's just a, a look at kind of the inner core um, internal processes of the hurricane. There's a number of uh, environmental factors that can also influence this process, such as uh, vertical wind shear or dry air or any combination of those. But we're going to focus in a little bit more actually at the air sea interface. And so just to show you how um, complicated this is, if I can play this video here. Uh, this is a video from a uh, sail drone from this past year. This is in Hurricane Sam. It was a category of four at the time. And what you're seeing is a whole lot of mess here at the ARC um, interface. You're seeing breaking waves. You're seeing uh, sea spray. You may be not able to see very far at all because there's so much junk being lofted up between the um, basically ocean into the atmosphere. And so all of these uh, complicated uh, processes, and I'll go ahead and play this again as I uh, continue to speak, are, are crucial to actually uh, represent in our numerical models in order to get these fluxes of, of latent and sensible heat and momentum uh, correct. And of course, we are not resolving all of these fine scales in numerical models. Um, so we need to represent them in, in some manner. So. Um, what is commonly done is to represent these fluxes in what's considered a bulk aerodynamic uh, sense. And so if we look at these equations for the latent and sensible heat flux here on the, the left, um, we can see that they're, they're functions of, of the disequilibrium between the air-sea interface, so the, um, you know, the thermodynamic disequilibrium basically between the ocean surface and the, the air and the boundary layer, as well as the, the wind speed, and it's often taken in numerical models to be at the wind speed at 10 meters. Um, and then you have this mysterious exchange coefficient, uh, CK, or the enthalpy exchange coefficient, as it's often called. And this enthalpy exchange coefficient is trying to represent kind of the efficiency of this, this um, either latent or sensible heat flux from the underlying ocean to the atmosphere. And of course, this isn't really just a, a bulk you know, transfer. It's involving all these processes that we saw in that video on the last slide. You, you have sea spray, you have uh, waves and breaking waves um, that you're trying to represent in a very simplified uh, manner in these numerical models. Uh, similarly, the momentum flux here is governed by uh, the square of the wind speed now and this, um, this surface drag coefficient, uh, CD. And, and just like with the enthalpy exchange coefficient, CK, this is trying to represent all of these, um, these sub, uh, subgrid processes that the numerical model is, is, is not uh, directly resolving. And just to kind of add further complexity to this, as you can see from just this picture in the, the video on the last slide, the ocean surface is you know, obviously responding to these, these strong surface winds, but so is the um, actual uh, ocean kind of beneath the surface. There's often strong vertical mixing that's taking place beneath the surface, and that's important because um, and there's also upwelling as a result of these kind of ocean waters being pushed away from the center of the storm. Um, but this vertical mixing really dominates what ends up being this, uh, this cooling of, of the sea surface, and this has of course, important feedbacks on these fluxes of latent and sensible heat. You can see this, this disequilibrium term here. So if you're cooling the ocean, you're having then a, um, a reduction of this disequilibrium and a reduction of these uh, fluxes, which of course is going to influence the whole, um, the whole processes above the boundary layer. So you know, in order to get these, these fluxes of latent and sensible heat right, you have to get a lot right. You have to um, get these exchange coefficients uh, correct, whatever uh, that means. And you have to you know, have the right winds. You have to have the right um, you know, ocean characteristics, um, and so on. And so you know, we're going to focus in on these exchange coefficients here just for a minute. Um, and that's because without a, a cuff-pulled wave model, you have to, well, you have to define a way to uh, represent CK and CD 
Um, anyway, and without a couple wave model, what's commonly done is you represent these as a, as a function of wind speed. And that has its own limitations, but that's, um, that's what's commonly done. And as we'll see in these uh, two figures here, of the enthalpy exchange coefficient as a function of wind speed on the left, and the drag coefficient uh, as a function of wind speed on the right. Uh, this is a recent review paper. So all of these different lines are different folks' estimates of these exchange coefficients. Exchange coefficients, excuse me. And they've actually done this in a variety of different manners to come up with these estimates. Some of them have used laboratory wave tank experiments. Um, some of them have tried to infer this from you know, indirect observations like dropsons. Um, but the takeaway here is if you look at these uh, two figures, none of these studies uh, really agree with each other. There's huge uncertainty once you get to about hurricane force winds, which is about 33 meters per second here. Um, you know, CK, we can't even agree on kind of the trend of how it changes with wind speed. Uh, and similarly with drag, there's this question of whether the drag saturates, uh, continues to increase a little bit, or even decreases at high wind speeds. Um, so there's just huge uncertainty in this, and a lot of this is related to these complicated processes, the sea spray, the breaking waves that we're trying to simplify in this manner by making this a function of the wind speed. Uh, but nonetheless, if you're not going to couple to a wave model, you have to make some choice of how you're going to represent CK and CD. So you have to choose one of these options, basically, or, or pick your own. And so as we'll see that that has which option you choose. And so we're going to start just by talking about uh, a single um, high impact a hurricane. Uh, it was an incredible storm from a 2015 Hurricane Patricia. Um, many of you might remember it. It uh, actually underwent the most rapid intensification we've ever observed, or the strongest storm we've ever observed by aircraft. Um, here's a picture of it on uh, satellite. So you can see these very cold cloud tops um, near the center, indicating a very, very intense hurricane. And um, you know, here is uh, the best track here in this thick black line. So you can see this is the category five, this last gray line. So this is an off the, off the chart uh, category five hurricane here. Um, this is in the Eastern Pacific, the coast of Mexico. Um, you can kind of make out right here in this gold line just to give you some context of where this happened. See these different forecasts either from HWARF and the, the dash lines or the official forecast from the National Hurricane Center here are really struggled with this storm. It's actually the, the largest errors on record. Um, in the Eastern Pacific, um, you know, early on, right at the beginning of its rapid intensification, um, forecasts were, you know, for a strong Category One, and you know, they're off by about, you know, 50 meters per second or so. Um, and even during, kind of, in the middle of its rapid intensification, uh, you're still much, much too weak here in terms of the intensity. And you know, even the often criticized HWARF model for in, in trying to over-intensify everything is actually under-intensifying uh, this storm. So um, again, even uh, say HWARF got this one uh, right. So I kind of, uh, during my PhD, I was interested in looking at, you know, can we do anything about these, these forecasts? So a relatively simple uh, question in, in, in theory. And um, the, the short answer to that, without going into all the details, is, is yes. Um, what I'm showing here on the left is some deterministic forecasts from basically the, in the mean of an ensemble data simulation system at various times. We've uh, rapidly cycled this um, DA system every hour, and through basically assimilating your conventional observations and these uh, high-density aircraft observations that the, the hurricane hunters were able to obtain, we're able to get some great uh, forecasts of this event. Um, if we actually look at kind of the uncertainty, um, we're just going to look at the ensemble associated with this, this T line here that was a good deterministic forecast. Um, we can get a sense of how much uncertainty there actually is in this forecast. So. Um, Basically, you can see there's a strong confidence or a high confidence in a, in a rapid intensifying hurricane. Uh, there's a lot of ensemble members that cluster near the truth in this, this black line. Uh, but you do have a fair number of members who either intensify too slowly, intensify too late, et cetera. Um, and that actually ends up being a result of how the intercourse structure was initialized as well as some uncertainty uh, in the environment. So if we were able to kind of um, generate such good forecasts, it begs the question of, well, what did, what did we do? Was it just the data assimilation, or were there other, other things going on here? And um, so just to kind of get at that question, um, what I'm showing here is the root mean square error, error of the maximum wind speed um, as a function of uh, forecast hour. This gold line is a no DA case. So it's basically an ensemble uh, without the inner core, a data assimilation just kind of uh, free running. And what you see here is very large intensity error. So this is similar to kind of what you saw in the official forecast or HWARF. 
Um, so obviously the intercore DA had a substantial impact. Um, this control or this blue line is just that ensemble that you actually saw on the last uh, slide. So you can see the benefit here of reducing your, your intercore um, uncertainty, your errors in your initial conditions, uh, basically through this data simulation. So that's great. Uh, you know, we're done. The, the DA solved it all. Well, uh, not so fast, of course. Um, if we actually use those same initial conditions and we just swap out the model choice for this representation of CD and CK, um, we get a, basically a very large increase back in our, in our error. So a different representation of these exchange coefficients has a, a, a large impact on this. We're actually approaching, you know, doing no data simulation at all once we're near kind of peak intensity here, which is where this peaks. Um, and just, I didn't pick some, uh, some poor choice necessarily of the exchange coefficients. This is actually a, um, a representation of CD and CK that had, had performed well in the past uh, for a number of other storms. Um, so obviously there's a lot of sensitivity to CD and CK. So if we kind of um, just take a breath and think of what, where we're at right now, uh, we know that the intensity prediction of, of tropical cyclones is, is strongly sensitive to this model representation of CD and CK. And so that begs the question of, of how does this uncertainty in CD and CK, which we haven't really sampled uh, systematically yet, influence the predictability of, of tropical cyclones relative to you know, other factors, relative to the uncertainty, say, in the environment. And so that's the, the first kind of question that I um, was working on here as a postdoc um, um, in collaboration with, with Falco. And so what we did is we uh, designed a series of, of nine ensembles, in this case for, again, we're gonna work with Hurricane Patricia because we know it is a, um, a storm that's sensitive to these exchange coefficients. And it's actually a storm, as we'll see, that has high intrinsic predictability, uh, but yet forecasts were, were, were very poor. So um, there's theoretically a large room for, for forecast improvement. And so our first set of ensembles here um, is gonna sample the systematic uncertainty in CD and CK. And so you can think of this set of ensembles as kind of representing this pre uh, practical predictability. So with 40% systematic uncertainty in CD and CK, we're, we're kind of sampling our current uh, prediction capabilities. And then as we reduce this uncertainty, we're, we're looking at what kind of gains in practical predictability could we get if, if somehow we're able to reduce these current uncertainties in CD and CK. Okay, so just a, a look at what those uncertainties look like is here on the upper right. Uh, it's a small figure, but basically these ensemble members will sample these uh, respective uncertainties and it'll, it'll retain the relationship of CD and CK as a function of wind speed uh, throughout the forecast. So these uh, perturbations are gonna be spatially and, and temporally correlated. Uh, the second set of um, ensemble set is gonna look at stochastically perturbing CD and CK. So instead of allowing these uh, perturbations to be spatially and temporally correlated. Or what happens if you basically randomly perturb um, CD and CK at each grid cell, you know, every time this, the, the surface fluxes are calculated. So these are gonna be spatially and temporally uncorrelated. So two ways of including this uncertainty in the design of your ensemble, potentially. And then we're gonna compare those with um, two other ensembles. The first, CB3 is sampling your environmental um, initial condition uncertainty. So it's some climatological perturbations to the environment. So that's another measure of your, your practical predictability in a way. And the last one's gonna be this intrinsic limit. And that's just done by adding some random, very small perturbations to the boundary layer of moisture. Okay. So all of these forecasts end up uh, with a very strong um, category five hurricane. The ensemble mean of all of these is very similar. So we're just gonna look at, uh, focus in on the actual uncertainty of the forecast. And so what I'm showing here on the left is the um, standard deviation of the maximum wind speed and the right is the minimum pressure. So pick your favorite um, intensity metric here. And what we see is our largest uncertainty, largest standard deviation comes when you have this 40% uncertainty in CD and CK. So right, our current uncertainty in the exchange coefficients is kind of your, your current limiting factor, at least uh, for this case. As we reduce our uncertainty to 30 or 20%, uh, you can see this reduction in the maximum wind speed or this continual reduction in the minimum pressure. So this is you know, highlighting the potential gains in practical predictability that you could get if you were able to actually uh, reduce this uncertainty in the exchange coefficients. Reducing further to 10% here, this blue line, we see we've now crossed underneath this purple line, which uh, is the CV3 ensemble or that 
environmental uh, initial condition uncertainty. So this is the uncertainty that's coming from the environment. So you can see now that once we get to about 10%, we've now become, uh, we've resulted in less uncertainty in the intensity forecast than that caused by the environment. So that's uh, perhaps a crucial uh, threshold. And the last thing we'll notice here is that as you get down to 1%, um, you've now approached your intrinsic limit, which is this a gray line that's on top of a few others. Um, and so kind of all, reducing these exchange coefficients all the way down to 1% kind of continues to give you um, gains in terms of your predictability. Uh, the one thing you'll notice is that you look at the uncertainty and you don't notice the stochastic um, ensembles anywhere on here. Um, they're down here very near the intrinsic limit. So stochastically perturbing a CD and CK has really minimal influence on, on the intensity uncertainty. And so it's probably not the best way of kind of representing this uncertainty if you're going to design, uh, representing the uncertainty in CD and CK within, within an ensemble. All right, so that's a look at the uh, pointwise metrics of intensity. Um, let's move on to a, a quick look at the actual structure of the storm. Um, and so here, again, showing the uncertainty, the standard deviation of the radial extent of hurricane force winds on the left. So that's kind of the extent of your, your damaging winds. And on the right is your integrated kinetic energy. So this is you know, basically taking into account both the intensity and the, the size of the storm. So it's a great measure of kind of the overall destructiveness uh, of a hurricane. And overall, you see similar trends to what we saw in the intensity. Our largest uncertainty is coming with this 40% uncertainty in CDE and CK. As we reduce this uncertainty down to you know, 30, 20, 10%, uh, we're seeing this continual uh, reduction in our in the, um, the uncertainty in the TC structure. Uh, similarly, this crossover with um, CB3 happens around uh, 10 to 20 percent. So that's a kind of important or maybe a useful goal to where we want to get this uncertainty in CD and CK down to, if, if possible. And you know, still stochastically perturbing CD and CK ha has minimal influence on on the the forecast uncertainty. All right, so you know. That's kind of a, a look at the, the metrics, uh, so to speak. Um, and so now what I'm going to show is kind of more visually the differences, actually, between these ensembles. So what I'm showing here in this, this top row is the first 10 members of this ensemble with 40% uncertainty in CD and CK. So you can get a sense of how much variability there is across the uh, ensemble. And you can see most of these storms, if you were looking at them, these is, you know, radar reflectivity simulated by the model. They look like um, pretty strong major hurricanes, right? Uh, but there's clear differences in kind of the, the spatial coverage of the convection. Um, and this first member especially is, is noticeably weaker than any of the others. You can see this eastern eye wall here is partially um, open, um, which is you know, what you would expect for kind of a weaker, a weaker hurricane. Um, so, so definitely a, a range of possibilities here. As we reduce this uncertainty in CD and CK uh, further to 30 a percent, we can see our, our storms are becoming increasingly uh, similar. Um, you still have a member here that noticeably has a smaller um, convective area than the others. Um, as we kind of go further down to 20%, you can see again they're becoming increasingly similar. As we get down to 10% now, they're, they're very clearly all you know, strong, major hurricanes um, with, with relatively similar uh, convective structures on kind of the storm scale. Um, if you look at kind of the individual structures of say the rain band or the individual convective cells, which is probably uh, hard to see, um, there are, of course, differences in the location of individual convectum cells or even the um, kind of some of the rain bands that are there or not there. Um, so, you know, this predictability is, of course, uh, scale dependent, you know, just because you're gaining predictability on kind of the, the storm scale, the intensity of the storm, the overall size of it. Um, there's still plenty of uncertainty in the location and convective structures. So as we talk about this uh, forecast uncertainty, I kind of want to go back to these, um, these actual surface fluxes, which I uh, hopefully motivated at the beginning of this, this talk. And remember, we're, we're perturbing CD and CK, and they matter because they actually influence the, um, the surface fluxes of enthalpy or uh, momentum. And so what I'm showing here is the, the standard deviation of the total enthalpy flux. So this is the sum of the latent and sensible heat fluxes, uh, primarily uh, dominated by your latent uh, heat fluxes, which is much larger than your, your sensible. A heat flux, but what you see here going from, you know, as you reduce your uncertainty in CD and CK from 40 down to 10% or 1%, you see this continual reduction in your surface enthalpy fluxes. And that's expected because your enthalpy flux is proportional to, you know, 
this exchange coefficient, which you're reducing the uncertainty in. Um, if we look at our stochastic ensemble here, though, we see that there's quite a bit of uncertainty, actually, in your, your enthalpy fluxes at individual points, right? It's actually pretty similar to this 20% um, systematic uncertainty in CD and CK. And, you know, that's coming because we're adding, you know, these random perturbations to CK. But these, um, this uncertainty in the enthalpy fluxes kind of on the, the grid scales is, isn't feeding back to the, to, uh, to the storm dynamics in some way. Um, and the last thing you'll notice is that these last two panels, CV3 and intrinsic, um, we still do, of course, get uncertainty in the enthalpy fluxes, and that's not because we're perturbing CK, but because you're getting differences in your, your wind speed, right? You're getting uh, differences in the structure of the storm uh, slightly. And so let's dig in a little bit uh, to this uh, stochastic experiment of why um, there's plenty of uncertainty on kind of the grid scale, but it's not feeding back on the storm scale. And so uh, if we focus on the top uh, first, these two figures are showing on the left the average uncertainty of the inner core fluxes of either uh, the friction velocity, which is closely related to the momentum flux, or the um, enthalpy flux here on the right. And so what it's done is you basically take those, those figures that we show on the last slide and we just average that uncertainty within, within the inner core region. And we notice that, you know, as you go from 40 down to 1% systematic uncertainty, you're seeing this reduction in your you know, average uncertainty of the inner core fluxes, uh, consistent with what we just saw in the last uh, figure. Um, but we also see these two stochastic experiments, the you know, two times stochastic or the stochastic, um, you know, that there's plenty of uncertainty if you kind of average within the inner core um, region. Um, but remember, it's not feeding back and actually resulting in any, any appreciable uncertainty on kind of the storm's intensity or structure. So another way of looking at this is to um, first average the, the fluxes, either the, um, the momentum flux, or in this case, the friction velocity within the inner core, and then look at the um, uncertainty in kind of that area average. Um, momentum flux or enthalpy flux here, and we notice, okay, the, the systematic uncertainty, we see the similar trend where you reduce the uncertainty in CD and CK, and you see this uh, decreasing um, uncertainty in the kind of area average uh, fluxes. But we notice that the uncertainty in the um, stochastic experience has dropped off, um, just like we expected. So what, what's happening is you're perturbing uh, these enthalpy fluxes and momentum fluxes on individual grid cells, but when you kind of integrate that, all those perturbations together within the inner core, you're, you're effectively getting no perturbations, right? So this gives you some sense that what the hurricane actually cares about. It cares about the kind of cumulative surface fluxes that it was able to um, generate as it, you know, as those parcels of air spiraled inwards towards the center. So just because you're adding positive perturbations in one place and negative perturbations in another, you basically add that all up and you, you have basically the same uh, fluxes across that ensemble. And so um, that's kind of why stochastically perturbing uh, CD and CK kind of with no uh, spatial and temporal scale has limited influence. And so the, the takeaway so far is that there's a lot of opportunity if we're able to reduce our current uncertainties in, in CD and CK to, to really reduce uncertainty in both the intensity and structure uh, of intense tropical cyclones. And, and kind of the, the second major takeaway is that perturbing CD and CK stochastically is not a great way to account for this uncertainty in an ensemble. Right, so uh, this, this paper uh, with Falco is, is uh, conditionally accepted and, and should be out soon. Um, and, you know, we look at some other aspects in there related to kind of some of the scale, a dependent predictability of, um, of the inner core structure of, of the storm as well. And so where we're at right now is that CD and CK are highly uncertain. We saw that um, kind of that nice um, figure at the beginning of the talk. And that they actually do limit the predictability of intense tropical cyclones, right, or at least the, the one case I just showed. So it begs the question of, well, what can we do about that with, with very limited observations at the ARC interface and, you know, very complicated um, processes that are, you know, admittedly oversimplified in, in most numerical models. And so the approach that I'm actually uh, looking at, and this has uh, been in collaboration with, with Chris Snyder and, and Moha uh, Garamati, is to actually try and apply a data simulation to this problem. And so, you know, data simulation is this problem which we often, we're combining 
uh, information from usually a prior model forecast or forecasts uh, with observations. And each of these, of course, have uncertainty associated with them. And through Bayes' theorem, we can actually combine uh, these PDFs and get a new analysis which um, has less uncertainty than either the prior forecast or uh, the observation. And, and through a bunch of assumptions, we can arrive at the ENKF update equations or the ensemble common filter. And so in the ensemble common filter, we're updating some, some prior forecasts with some uh, weighted difference between an observation and the prior forecast. And this, this weight, the Kalman gain as it's often referred to, is actually going to be leveraging this ensemble forecast uh, from a prior, uh, a prior analysis. And so this prior forecast is going to sample the, the forecasted PDF here. Um, but it's also going to be used to calculate the um, error covariance here. That's uh, flow dependence. So you now have a relationship basically between uh, different state variables. And we'll see how this is potentially useful for the uh, parameters also. And so you can make a slight uh, modification to the ENKF update equation here uh, to actually estimate the parameters. And so what I've done is you take this state vector and you create what's called an augmented state vector, which means instead of just including your state vector, which is all of your, your model state variables, such as your wind, your temperature, moisture, et cetera, and all of your, your model grid cells, um, you also include a vector of your parameters uh, you wish to update. And so in doing so, your Kalman gain inside of it, now uh, the ensemble covariance actually includes a covariance between the parameters you wish to estimate and your forecasted model state. Okay, so this, this covariance, this relationship that's estimated during some, some short-term or long-term ensemble forecast is actually where all the power comes in or all of the... Um, the magic comes in in terms of being a, to update these parameters, right? So it, it's analogous to how we update, um, say, the temperature at a point um, in the ensemble common filter with, you know, um, an observation of the wind at some at some point. It's done through the ensemble estimated covariance, which is is flow dependent. But in this case, we are now um, we care about this uh, covariance between the forecast and this parameter, right? So we, you know, it's the sensitivity basically between these two. And we're gonna we'll come back to this concept of you know, some challenges in actually getting this uh, covariance uh, correct in, in just a few slides. Um, but first, what are those parameters that I'm actually interested in? Um, I have three, alpha, VC, and beta. Uh, we're gonna focus on uh, two of them today, alpha and beta, uh, because they're the kind of easiest and most straightforward to deal with. Uh, but alpha is a multiplicative factor on the surface drag, so as you increase alpha, you're increasing uh, CD, and that's done at, at all wind speeds. Um, and there's actually a response in, in WARF, which is the numerical model I'm using uh, in CK through the, the surface roughness. So CK actually has some uh, secondary dependence on the drag. Um, and uh, beta is a multiplicative factor on, on CK alone. So as you increase beta, you're increasing uh, CK. Uh, this third parameter, VC, actually allows you to change the profile in this high wind speed regime. Uh, so if you were to have a VC of you know, 30, you would have the saturation at 30 meters per second. If you increase VC, you allow the drag to drop off actually before, before saturating. So through this combination of parameters, you're able to create all sorts of different combinations, um, all sorts of different representations of, of CD and CK, uh, but they're still functions of, of wind speed. Okay, so before we get into actually um, any data simulation uh, results, I just wanna talk about some of the sensitivity to these uh, parameters here. So on the, the top, what I'm showing is actually the correlation between the initial intensity in terms of either the maximum wind speed, V10, or the minimum pressure, and the forecasted um, intensity at various lead times. So what you're seeing here is, you know, early on you're well correlated to basically your initial intensity of the storm, right? That's to be expected. And this, um, this ensemble forecast I'm showing is right near actually in uh, RI onset, so the onset of rapid intensification. But as you go out and forecast, lead time, of course, the sensitivity, the initial intensity of the storm uh, decreases. And at the same time, if we look at this correlation now between um, the minimum pressure and alpha and beta, we see that um, the sensitivity to these parameters, this basically that's providing the forcing for this through the surface fluxes, is, is generally increasing throughout the forecast. So you're becoming you know, less sensitive to your initial intensity of the storm as you go out in time, and more insensitive to how you represent the exchange coefficients, right? So beta, for instance, is strongly negatively 
uh, correlated with the minimum pressure. So as you increase beta, uh, basically you're increasing uh, CK, you're increasing your moist enthalpy fluxes, and you're getting a, a lower minimum pressure, a stronger uh, storm. Uh, during, you know, near RI onset, alpha is weakly, uh, negatively correlated with minimum pressure, and that has to do with how alpha, basically because you increase alpha, you're increasing the drag, you're helping to actually increase some of the convergence uh, within the boundary layer and actually helping to spin up the storm a little bit quicker. Uh, if we look at a later stage of RI, um, again, we can see uh, an ensemble forecast at this time. The sensitivity, the kind of initial intensity, again, drops off pretty quickly. Um, it actually drops off more quickly than near RI onset. Um, and the you know, or sensitivity of these parameters, again, increases as you go out and forecast. Lead time, um, beta is similarly negatively correlated. Alpha is actually now positively uh, cor correlated with your intensity. And that's because as you increase alpha, you're increasing your, your drag. And at these strong stages, you're basically, that's increasing your friction and, and basically removing um, kind of momentum uh, from, from the storm and weakening it. All right, so we can already see that there's you know, times that the, the storm is going to be more or less sensitive to the initial conditions and, and more or less sensitive to the initial parameters. And this is going to be important because we want to develop that sensitivity between these parameters and, and the state, right? That covariance um, that's going to be used in the Kalman game. And so um, here I'm going to take a look at actually some correlations with observations that are actually going to be used during uh, the DA update. And what I'm showing here is correlations with uh, simulated brightness temperatures. So this is infrared brightness temperatures. So you're looking at the cloud top temperatures, basically. Um, and these are correlations with either alpha on the top or beta on the bottom. And again, we're going out further in, a, in an ensemble forecast here as you go from left to right. And what you'll see is that one of the first things you'll notice is that these, these correlations you know, become stronger as you increase in, um, you know, as you go further along in the forecast, right? So it takes time to build up sensitivity uh, to these physics parameters. Right. And uh, the second thing you'll notice is both of these at this uh, particular time are, are largely negatively correlated with the brightness temperature. So for alpha, again, this is near RI onset when this forecast was um, initialized. And you can see this contour of uh, sea level pressure. Um, basically, you can see the storm intensifying here is what you're, what you're seeing. Um, you can see that these negative correlations are suggesting colder uh, cloud top temperatures with increased uh, values of alpha or increased drag. So that, again, has related back to the increased convergence within the boundary layer that this increased drag is helping to, to drive near, near RI onset. Uh, in terms of beta, these negative correlations are related to the increased moisture uh, fluxes in the boundary layer, helping to you know, drive deeper convection and therefore a colder cloud tops. Um, these positive correlations very near the center here that you can see it a few times are actually likely representative of a cloud-free eye and perhaps even uh, some sampling of, of the warm core uh, at upper levels. And so, you know, if we want to have a good ensemble estimated covariance, how these parameters relate to the state, we need to make sure we allow adequate time for sensitivity to build up. And this kind of gives us some idea that as you go out to maybe 24 hours or so into the forecast, you end up with, you know, quite a bit of a robust sensitivity to these parameters. Uh, kind of the second thing that can really influence this, um, this covariance is basically your ensemble size. And um, that's how many samples you basically have estimating this covariance. And we can see, again, correlations between uh, brightness temperature and alpha or beta and with different ensemble sizes. So we're going from 30 to 480 members as you go from left to right. And what you see is, well, a, a reduction in the magnitude of these correlations, uh, but also a reduction in really the noise uh, within these correlations. And so you're reducing the sampling error. Um, and so you perhaps need a, a, a larger ensemble size if you really want to get after these parameters. Um, another way of looking at the effect of, of sampling error is to actually correlate with some a meaningless parameter here, um, which we've called epsilon. So this has absolutely nothing to do with the, the, the forecast. This is actually just basically we're correlating with noise. And what we see is um, whether it's brightness temperature or sea level pressure, when you have a very, ensemble, uh, very small ensemble size, 30 members, you have a whole lot of basically noise that you're correlating with. And that's, uh, this noise is, is actually kind of structured. It's not completely random. Um, and it's likely related to some of the structural differences in, in the ensemble members of either the brightness temperature, you can see kind of some of this banding structure, potentially, um, and you know, sea level pressure is fairly, fairly uniform. 
Um, as, even as you get to 60 members, which is commonly used if you're just going to do state estimation with a real-time uh, DA system, uh, you can see plenty of, of sampling error. And once you get out to 120 or, or 480 members, you now have really reduced all of this kind of erroneous sampling error. So this gives you some signs that you need to get out in this kind of ensemble size in terms of having a good um, or well-estimated covariance between the parameters and, and your state. All right, so let's actually get into uh, the DA here on the final uh, couple of slides. And so the approach that I'm using is actually a um, kind of a variant of the ensemble Kalman filter. It's called the um, you know, one step ahead ensemble Kalman uh, smoother or the ensemble Kalman filter with one step ahead smoothing. Um, and there's a, a number of uh, papers that have come out in the past handful of years that kind of introduce this, this method. And so if you look at the ENKF update equation here, it looks uh, fairly similar. Uh, the difference is you're updating your state or your parameters with actually observations at some future time. So this T plus S represents some uh, future time. And this is actually done through the uh, covariance still that's estimated, uh, basically has a temporal component to the covariance now. And so if we um, if we look at how we're actually doing this in our, in our experiments, we're, we have basically a 24-hour forecast, a uh, 24-hour ensemble forecast, and we're using the ensemble estimated covariance at, at 24 hours to actually update the parameters uh, back at, at time zero or time t. Um, of course, the, the parameters aren't actually evolving during this forecast, so the, the covariance of, uh, with them isn't necessarily um, matter, but it does matter when you're doing the state update. Right. Um, just like we updated the, um, the parameters with future observations, we can actually update the state with future observations. And in this case, we're doing so at just an hour lead time. And so this is operating under kind of that, that framework that at long lead times, we know that our ensemble is most sensitive to the kind of forcing that's coming from these surface exchange coefficients. But at, at short lead times, um, we're driven by basically our initial state uncertainty. And um, we can cycle this through just like a, a traditional ENKF. Um, the major negative of this, or one of them, is that it's a lot more computationally expensive than an ensemble common filter. So in a traditional ENKF, you just run a short ensemble forecast, maybe an hour or two. Um, here, I'm actually running a 24-hour, so a one-day ensemble forecast every hour. Um, so it's a heck of a lot more expensive, but we can do this in, in a research mode. Um, the other negative here is this really isn't real-time uh, compatible uh, because I'm using future observations. So this isn't something that could be done necessarily in real time. Okay, so how does it uh, perform? Um, just to kind of close out here. Um, here we're looking at um, alpha, which remember is our CD parameter. It's initially underestimated, so the red is the mean, the blue shaded area is one uh, standard deviation, and the black line is actually tr the truth. So this is an observing system simulation experiment, which means we generate you know, a truth forecast with some known values of alpha and beta. We can sample observations from that and then assimilate those and compare basically against this, this truth forecast. So unlike a real data case where we wouldn't necessarily know if we've recovered the, the true CD and CK, here we actually know what, the, what it is. And so what we see here is they're both initially underestimated and they quickly increase. Alpha, you know, increases close to its true value. Beta really, really overshoots it, right? Um, but then it, you know, it does nicely come back down towards closer to the truth value and kind of out here after two days of cycling, you know, the truth is within standard deviation of your, um, your data simulation estimate. So this is a, a pretty successful example of the parameter estimation. And so let's just dig in uh, here to close of what's actually going on at these early cycles because I think it gives some insights into how the parameter estimation actually works. And so this is the ensemble forecast that is uh, being used to basically update the parameters at that time. And remember, we're doing the update with observations at 24 hours into the forecast. And so if we look at the, the ensemble forecast here, I'm just looking at the minimum pressure here on the bottom. Uh, the truth, again, is the black. The red is now that uh, ensemble mean. And we can see that our, our ensemble is generally too weak uh, relative to the truth. So when you're assimilating these observations that's suggesting a stronger hurricane, what ends up happening is because beta is positively correlated with the intensity of the storm, you end up increasing beta. Well, that's actually good because beta is initially underestimated. Um, the problem is that this, this effect actually accumulates over a handful of initial cycles because it takes the ensemble time to catch up to the kind of true intensity of the storm. And then what happens is if we look at a, a forecast at kind of cycle 24, so this is well into the intensification, um, and now your ensemble is actually too strong. If you look out here at 24 hours, you see your ensemble mean is stronger than your truth. And so now these values of 
you know, the uh, parameter estimation is trying to kind of bring these intensities uh, back down, weaken the storm, and one of the ways it's doing that is to help, is to decrease uh, beta, actually, and bring it back closer to its truth. And so if we look at kind of the end of our cycling, just to get a sense for how these ensembles are performing, um, we can see that the forecasts are now pretty well calibrated to kind of the truth in, uh, true intensity of the storm, um, kind of right when our parameters are also uh, pretty well behaved near the truth. And so I'll just close um, with kind of an example here on the, the bottom showing a case where alpha and beta are initially overestimated, so a different starting value of these parameters. And you can see in this case, again, it takes some time, but you do uh, get you know, kind of the true parameters uh, pretty well recovered here once you get to kind of the steady state period of the storm. So I have to get through the kind of rapid intensification, which seems to be a, a challenging period. And so just to, just to summarize, uh, the predictability of tropical cyclones is, is strongly sensitive to both um, your initial state uncertainty as well as some aspects of the model physics. And we talked today about the importance of these surface exchange coefficients. And um, you know, there is some, some hope, at least in these um, observing system simulation experiments of trying to constrain uh, these surface exchange coefficients within the data simulation system. Uh, of course, um, we're still treating them as, as functions of wind speed, and so that has its own limitations because, of course, you know, these exchange coefficients really have a lot of heterogeneity are related to the heterogeneity in the, in the ocean surface. Um, but there's, there's some hope. Okay, so uh, the uh, talk is open for questions. Um, Jimmy? So in these Aussies, uh, what kind of observation density did you need to get this kind of convergence? It should be sensitive to that. Yeah, thanks. So um, what we're using is basically simulated uh, observations of infrared brightness temperature observations, such as that from you know, GOES-13 or GOES-16. They are, they are all sky, um, so it's really the, the cloud structure. And so it's about, um, what is it? It's about uh, six kilometers, I believe, is about the resolution that we're, that we're thin to there. Yeah, yeah, they're simulated real observations, yeah. And uh, I guess the choice of brightness temperature observations might seem odd to a number of folks in here, right? We're using something up at the, the cloud tops to constrain something that's happening down at the air sea interface. Um, well, it's probably not the most ideal choice uh, of observations, but it is you know, the one type of observation that we basically always have. Um, and I think if you want to do this parameter estimation, um, you need an observation that you regularly have. We are lucky if we have maybe an aircraft observation once a day um, through a hurricane, so. Uh, questions, further questions? George? Um, so you're, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're only doing atmospheric data simulation and parameter estimation. What do you mean by atmospheric? Uh, well, you're not, you're not uh, atmospheric. Atmospheric, right? yes. Um, so what if you were doing ocean data <laughs> simulation here? Or I, I guess maybe another way of, of phrasing it, do, do you have a sense for whether CK would, for example, would still be the most important parameter or if it's your estimate of the ocean conditions um, would be also an issue here? Yeah, so uh, the short answer to that is the ocean's gonna matter, right? Um, you know, how much relative to the exchange coefficient is probably gonna depend on, well, how much uncertainty you add to the ocean. If you add enough uncertainty to it, then it's gonna be, you know, equally or is more important, right? Your fluxes are related to, you know, these exchange coefficients, the disequilibrium, or the wind speed. So if you change any of those, you're gonna change your fluxes, which is what the hurricane really cares about. Um, you know, in terms of, trying to recover the, the true exchange coefficients, I think you need to couple with an ocean model you know, while you're doing the parameter estimation. While you, whether you estimate the ocean at the same time or you kind of let it go is, has different drawbacks there. Um, but if you wanna get the right ones, which are still not right because they're not a function of wind speed, um, but maybe a useful one, uh, um, yeah, I think you wanna couple with the ocean. Otherwise, you're gonna account for errors likely in your lack of ocean coupling in whatever you estimate the exchange coefficients to be. And that might be okay under some conditions, but as soon as the interactions with the ocean are different in some other storm, now you're gonna, you're gonna have errors again. So ideally, uh, what, is there some kind of universality you can attach to these uh, estimations, like in terms of 
some formula that you could use for all storms? Or was it just for these particular storms that you come up with the best? It's a good question, right? The question is how to, basically, in essence, how to use this going forward in, in practice, right? If you do it for one storm, you estimate the exchange coefficients, is that any good for ever, any other storm, basically, or is it only good for, for that storm? And I, the short answer is I don't know. Um, I think you know, the strategy is probably to do this for a number of storms and then take some average over those cases and say, OK, this is representative. And who knows how much uncertainty there's going to be from case to case. Prepare yourself. Yes. This is from a I always get nervous when Morris gets the mic. Yes. It, it seems to me, isn't there a danger that you're assuming the correlations are direct, cause and effect type of direct, but isn't there a danger that um, the, cor the true correlations in the variables are different uh, with different variables and you're seeing just as an associated correlation? Sure, that danger is definitely there. It's always there, actually, when you're doing ensemble data simulation. It doesn't matter if you're updating the temperature with a wind observation somewhere. You're relying on however good that ensemble estimated relationship is between the two. So we follow the same pitfalls with parameter estimation as you know, state updating is. Um, it's just potentially, in some ways, scarier, right? Yeah. So, I, so in terms of trying to come up with a general formula for the CK, and you've got to be a little cautious because it, you might not be seeing the right correlations for the right reasons, although it's, it's working better. Yeah, I think it, uh, it depends, right? It depends how good your ensemble is and how good your, your state estimate is, right? If you have errors in your state, you're still likely going to account for some of that in, in, in the parameters. I mean, we saw that in, you know, early on during the rapid intensification. Yeah. Uh, so I have a question uh, about the uh, Patricia Ensemble that you showed in the very beginning. I noticed a few members bring it up to 120 meters per second. So is, that's obviously stronger than any hurricane we have observed. Um, have we just not observed those strong hurricanes, or is there some fundamental issue possibly in the model? Yeah. Um, what's your opinion on that? Yeah, so those... Uh, first off, those ensembles were all not ocean coupled, right? So they could be overdoing it because of the lack of ocean coupling there. Um, so that could be part of it. Um, whether it's possible, I don't know. Patricia was in a super favorable environment. I mean, the SSTs were kind of near record warm, um, had a nice compact uh, storm. So I think it's an interesting question whether it would have intensified more if it had more time before it basically interacted with, with land and actually the shear increased a little bit. As, as well, so as, as strong as it got, I guess there's no guarantee it got as strong as it could have. Okay, um, I don't think I see any other further questions, but I do have enough. <laughs> I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about your prior elicitation for the Bayes theorem stuff and what that looks like, because I've only dabbled in Bayes for public opinion research. Um, I'm so interested in a very different context, how you did that and kind of what the impacts of those priors and your uh, assumed confidence was on your output around the Bayes-related stuff. So we're, we're not directly solving Bayes theorem, uh, I think is the important thing here. The ENKF has made a number of assumptions to Bayes theorem. Actually, all data simulation is basically uh, making some assumptions. Uh, it's just a matter how good those are. So we've made assumptions of, of Gaussianity is probably one of the most limiting ones, which our priors are likely to be non-Gaussian. And you know, the priors of different state variables, like infrared brightness temperature, for instance, is likely to be highly non-Gaussian. Um, you know, you basically have very cold cloud tops when you have cloud, and you have warmer, much warmer cloud tops when you, when you don't. So you kind of have, you can think of that as a bimodal distribution. So um, it's not a great answer to your question, but the, the short answer is that we are not solving Bayes' theorem directly. We're solving it under a number of assumptions that are, are what they are. Uh -huh. Thanks. But you, you, you do make assumptions so, about the prior answer. Yes, theory. yeah. They're not unreasonable. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> they, they work. They're practical assumptions. Right, so yeah. I guess my follow-up is, I mean, there are assumptions. There's an initial sort of 
variance that's associated with those parameters that is broadly consistent with the, the variability you saw in the, say, the observational fits at the beginning. Um, and the, you know, the eventual value of the parameter that you estimate is not super sensitive to that initial. What it's really sensitive is there's also something in the algorithm that's saying after each update, how much uh, we sort of, you bound how yep. much uncertainty you leave in the, yep. in the parameter. Yep. Uh, and that, that it has to do with the, the sampling error from a finite ensemble biasing you towards reducing that too much. Yep, and I think one of the other important differences with the parameter updates that Chris sort of just touched on is that when you're reducing your variance every time you update. Um, and you know, your state variance is gonna in actually increase during the forecast step, but your, your parameters, you don't. You basically, so if you're not careful, and if you're not doing something, you're gonna just reduce your uncertainty and your parameters to zero, and then you don't update them anymore because there's no uncertainty. So we're actually basically capping the extent to which we can uh, reduce it, which I didn't mention here today. So that is something that we're, we're doing to maintain some some variance there, along with what Chris was saying. Okay, uh, I think. Um, yep, Peter. Yeah, we have one. Uh, Rob, I was um, uh, a naive question. Um, uh, what's the relationship with uh, machine learning, or are they related at all? Uh, which one could potentially get you? To the just offer up an yep. opinion in that in that spirit. Yeah. So my take on this is that there's a lot of overlap between what data simulation is trying to accomplish, whatever form you take, and what machine learning is trying to accomplish. Uh, the main difference here is that machine learning is really useful when you have a lot of data, um, and one thing we don't have related to the ERC interface is a lot of observations. Um, so I think that is a, a knock at least against machine learning. Um, are there potentially ways to do it with large ensembles or with large you know, model forecasts, maybe? Um, uh, you know, are there ways to loop kind of some of the machine learning stuff into the, the DA? Yes, yeah, there's a lot of work going on there. So there's, I think, some overlap there, but um, you know, I, I don't know if machine learning is the answer. You know, it's a scenario where we don't have a lot of, a lot of data and a lot of observations, and that's you know, kind of the end of the extreme where Data simulation is very useful in terms of constraining things with limited observations. So that's kind of my take on that. Um, I don't see any questions on the Slido. Um, so I think uh, we are, uh, David? No, no. Okay, so then uh, I think we're at the end of our seminar. Thanks again, Robert. Thank you. Thank you.